Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so glad that we get to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So glad that we get to worship together. If you would, please pray with me. Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that today is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. We thank you that we get to come into your house and worship you and praise you. Father, we just give you this service. We ask that you have your way in it, Lord, that you lead us, that you um, allow us to enter into your presence, Lord, with singing and praise, Lord, and that we would be edified by your word this morning. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus. There's just something about your name, Lord. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's forgiveness in the name of Je Jesus. Demons tremble at the sound of that name. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for you alone are worthy. You are our King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the Prince of peace. There's no one like you, Lord Jesus. And to your name be glory and honor and praise throughout all generations forever and ever. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We are your people called by your name, Lord. And Lord, we ask now, Lord, that you speak to us in your word, Lord. That you illuminate your word to us. That you open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us, Lord. And that your people who are called by your name, Lord, that we could humble ourselves and pray. And that you would heal our land, Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we magnify the name of Jesus. It's in that precious and holy name we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, worship team. Amen. Well, praise God. Today is a good day. It's the first day in my life that there weren't thousands and thousands of unborn children murdered today. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God because he is worthy and he does the impossible and he brings about great victories for his people. What a wonderful day. Uh, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to, well, we're going to read two verses today. The first is in 1 Kings chapter 8, two verses, 10 and 11, and then 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If you have your Bibles, turn there now, and if you don't, don't worry. Technology has made it possible for the words to be behind me on the screen. But I will say there is something important about the Word of God. There is something about holding it and seeing it and holding it in your hand. And I am, I am a person who I do use technology and I, I, I have my digital Bible and I love it and I get to see other translations real quick and it's awesome. But you never know when people might get mad and we won't have digital access to apps and things. And so it's important to have your Bible, to hide it deep in your heart. First Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And it came to pass, when the priests came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Lord, thank you for your word. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So the story thus far, we're going through scripture, we're going through um, the, the narrative of scripture this year, and boy, let me tell you, it's hard. <laughs> There's so much in scripture. Uh, that each story, each section deserves a whole year's worth of sermons on it because you can't, you can't exhaust the riches of God's word. It's impossible. I had a, I had a professor say, you know, the Bible uh, is a relatively small book compared to other books, but it's about this deep, he said. And so now we're at the temple, but how did we get here? Well, 
In the beginning, God. That one phrase would preach for a whole year. God who is indescribable. God who is transcendent. God who is all-powerful. God who is so other than what we are. God who dwells in unapproachable light. God who we can't even begin to fathom. Our minds cannot comprehend the complexity and the grandeur of God. God is completely and absolutely separate from us. We could never travel to get to God. You could travel to the edge of the universe. The known universe is massive. It boggles the mind how wide it is, and it's expanding. And yet, all of the universe cannot contain God. But God is love. And God is a person. It's a personality. God desired to have relationship with people, with persons, with individuals. And so he created a universe with the purpose of creating a family, Adam and Eve. And God created a good world for them and planted a perfect garden and told them, you are my image bearers. I have made you in my image. You reflect me. And your job is to reflect me on the earth. And I'm giving you all the earth. I'm giving you the keys of authority. And it's yours. Adam and Eve were essentially priest kings on the earth. They interacted with God. And it was their job to do God's will on the earth. And to expand the borders of Eden. To take dominion over the earth. And yet... Our first mother and father fell into temptation and plunged the world into sin. And a disease infected the descendants of Adam called sin. Adam broke the world with his disobedience. And he plunged the world into sin. And after Adam, each of us have taken the gift of God to choose and we have chosen evil. And if you were in the garden, you would have made the same decision. Because Adam was perfect, and you're not. What makes you think that you would have been able to, to do what Adam couldn't? And, and the world was broken, and it was messed up, and Satan had won. What was going to happen now? And God began to judge. And he set out curse, curses upon Adam upon Eve, and upon the serpent. But in these curses, there is a prophecy, a blessing, that one was coming who would crush the head of the serpent. The head, the, the, the source of which temptation and fallenness had come, the source of evil in our world, would be destroyed. And so, the story of the Bible starts. It's a, it's a narrative, it's a story of a family. Adam's family, Noah's family, Abraham's family, now David's family. And it was a story of how humanity is on this downward decline. Because humanity chose to disobey God. And then, not only did they sin, but... Before the flood, they became totally depraved, and God divorced the nations at Babel, and he chose the family of Abraham. And throughout this downward slide of man, as Satan is wreaking havoc on the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, God intervenes, and God intervenes, and God intervenes, because there's coming one who will destroy the head of the serpent. There's coming one who will redeem the sons of man. And so now, we reached, we reached David, who is the pinnacle in the Old Testament of messianic hope. He is an anointed one. He was anointed king over Israel. He would inherit the kingdom of Israel and expand the borders of Israel. And, and he's a descendant of Noah, and he's a descendant of Abraham, and there's all this hope and promise in David. And God has made a covenant with David. And David operates in a way that no other king can operate. David operates as like a priest king. 
He, he operates like a prophet. And there's something about David's relationship with God that is so amazing. But even David, like we heard last week, is affected by this sin. And though he fell, God once again demonstrated something that is pointing forward to a new covenant. God displayed amazing grace. Oh, how sweet the sound. David was a man after God's own heart. And when David was confronted with his sin, instead of saying, off with Nathan's head, kill him, get him out of here. I am the king. Nobody can critique me. Nobody can tell me anything because I am the king. David says, you're right. And he drops to his knees and he asks God to forgive him. And God, in his mercy and grace, forgives David. Well, that's it, right? I mean, David screwed up. That's all the hope. But no, David's son is now on the throne. And there are promises that David received that are being passed on to his children. Wait a minute. I thought David messed up. Yes, David messed up, but found forgiveness in the loving God of creation who is pointing to a new and better covenant that is coming because your righteous deeds can't save you. And now, David's son is inheriting blessings that he didn't earn because of the faithfulness of his father. And as we go forward, and as we look at the kings of Israel, there is something that is repeated throughout the book of Kings and Chronicles. This king sinned, but I remembered my covenant with David. The prayers, this is not the topic of my sermon, but the prayers of a father, the prayers of a mother, last generations. And there are blessings there that can be stored up for generations to come. The decisions you make right now in life will affect generations to come. And now Solomon is going to build the temple. We are talking about a, a giant cosmic shift. Now God is going to have a temple on the earth. And the temple takes on huge importance for the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. It becomes very important because this is the place on the earth where God has placed his name and his presence will be. This is the, the center of the universe now. Because God has allowed the family of David to build him a house for his presence. To where it says, and I will place my name there. The name. That's a, God revealed his name to Moses. I am that I am. There is no one like him. And when God places his name on, when someone bears the name of God, it is an important thing. It is a powerful thing. And now in Jerusalem, Solomon has built a temple and it is beautiful. There is nothing like it on the earth. Solomon spared no expense. God has blessed the family of David. And now Solomon is using all of those blessings that the Lord has given him. And he's giving back to the Lord and he's not sparing an expense on the building that he's going to build. It's made out of gold and silver and precious metals they spared no expense. This thing is magnificent. And this thing sits on a hill in Jerusalem. And so if you were walking into Jerusalem, you would, and the sun hit the gold on the temple, it would be like a city on a hill, a shining city. And it was beautiful in the eyes of the people and in the nation around. You could see it for miles because it sat on top of a hill and there was nothing around it. It's the tallest building at the uh, in the area, and it's made out of gold. But the thing that made it beautiful was not the gold or the silver or all the money that they poured into the building project. The thing that made it beautiful is what we read in First Kings. They brought the Ark of the Covenant into the holy place. They brought that Ark where the presence of God was, where the Shekinah glory was, that dwelt between the cherubim on the mercy seat. 
they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And it says that the glory cloud, the presence of God that was made visible and manifest, filled the temple. And the priests were overwhelmed and could not continue ministering there. I don't know what that feels like, but I want that to happen to our church. I want to be so overwhelmed by the presence of God that we can't go on with business as usual. Because God's presence is tangible. Because God's presence is felt that the priests are overwhelmed. It's not just in the holy place. It's in the whole temple. And the whole temple gets engulfed by the presence of God. As Solomon is praying and they're worshiping God. And the singers and the singers that were at the tabernacle of David are now at the temple. And they're worshiping the Lord and they're praising the Lord. And God's presence descends. And it overwhelms the priests. Man. How beautiful it is when God shows up. When God shows up and overwhelms you. I have prayed several times this week for people who have been overwhelmed by all kinds of things. Our church is going through it right now. And several times they've come and sort of explained similar situations. And I have prayed this prayer. Lord, we've been overwhelmed by bad things. And now, Lord, overwhelm us with your presence. And that's what I want for our church, to be overwhelmed by the presence of God. To be overwhelmed by God showing up, by Jesus showing up. Because when Jesus shows up, things change. When Jesus shows up, things are different. You may have been one way before. You, the, the situation may have been dire. Lord, you don't understand. This is what's going on. They're sick, Lord. They're, look at what they said, Lord. Look at the situation. Look how terrible. Look how awful. Look how this stupid snake has infected every aspect of life. But then Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up, everything is different. Everything is different. There is no power in hell that can withstand Jesus. Amen. Nothing, no sickness, no disease, no evil inclination of the heart can stand against the presence of God Almighty. And when God filled that temple, they were overwhelmed by his presence. Did you know that that thing, that, that cloud that showed up in the temple in the Old Testament. We don't often talk about this in church. But do you know that that has been experienced in the church since then? Did you know that? Did you know that at Azusa Street, which started the Pentecostal revival movement that is going around the world right now. Do you know that they experienced that? There are, there are testimonies from, well, they're older people now. Because this happened in like the 20s, 1900s. Uh, and they were little kids at the time, and now they're older. And so, but they said that the, when the Lord would show up, they would be worshiping. It says that Seymour, the guy who was leading um, the revival, he was, a, he was a black man. And they didn't let him go to the college where the, where the Pentecostal movement sort of started. They made him sit outside the front door. And so he was sitting outside the front door learning. They weren't letting him be part of what was going on. But then he got invited to LA. He got invited to Azusa Street. And he was, uh, they went to Azusa Street and there were, there were blacks and, and, and Mexicans. And, and the reason I know there were Mexicans because I got some relatives. Um, and they were, they were there and, and God, and he was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And one of the ladies got, bat, fell out, got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And from that moment, the Azusa Street Revival started. And the Azusa Street Revival lasted for years as they would go to Azusa and they would pray. And the this Holy Spirit was, was there palpably. They could feel the presence of the Lord. And people were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and finding out sort of for the first time that the gifts of the Spirit were available to us now. And it says, that, and I've read things that Seymour, the pastor, wouldn't even go to preach. He had a pulpit that was made out of milk cartons, and he would just be behind the pulpit the whole time praying. And he would pop out every once in a while, and then go back and pray, and pop out every once in a while, and go back and pray. And the presence of the Lord would be there, and it filled that little church in Azusa. 
I believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe that the presence of God that showed up in the beautiful, amazing, glorious temple that Solomon built for the Lord, the same presence that showed up there can show up here. That the Lord can show up and change things. And it does not matter what doubts or what lies Satan has been whispering into your head. You need to know that this is truth, that God's word is true, and that God, this is the unchangeable word of God. And what this says is true. It's truer than anything else that you know. Because it is the word of an eternal transcendent being who holds the cosmos in his hands. And so when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. When he says, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, you can have everlasting life. When he says... The, pr the prayers of faith will heal the sick. Prayers of faith will heal the sick. There's nothing impossible for God. But Solomon built a beautiful temple. He did not hold back from the construction of the temple. You think David was, exagger uh, was extravagant in his worship? What David left for Solomon and what Solomon had was even greater than when David brought the ark into Jerusalem. He didn't hold back anything. This building was magnificent. So much so that when the Babylonians and later the Romans came and they burnt it, it says that the gold was melting, that they started to dig out the rocks to try to get to the gold that was in the foundations because the gold was melting. It was such a beautiful building. And Solomon didn't hold anything back from the Lord. He made it beautiful. Jesus says in the New Testament, or the New Testament says, that now you and I are the temple. The new temple is made of living stones. Each one of you, each me, when I accepted Jesus into my heart, I became part of a living temple. And now it's not a building. Now it's you. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. What kind of building are you building for the Lord? What kind of material are you using in your life? Is, is, your, is your temple completely dedicated to the Lord? And are you holding anything back from him? Oh, I can't, I can't do that. Well, you know, I'm, I'll go to church on Sunday and I'll give my offering and that'll be enough. Solomon gave and gave and gave and held and didn't hold anything back from the Lord. And it was the most beautiful building in all of history. What does your temple look like? I'm not just saying you need to exercise more. We all need to exercise more. We, we need to do that. We need to eat right. Gluttony is also a sin. But how are you building your life? What materials are you using? Paul talks about in the New Testament that our works, the things that we do, they're going to be tested through fire. And if it's chaff, if it's straw, it's going to be burned up. But if it's gold or silver or precious metals, it'll withstand what are you using in your temple, in your walk with the Lord? Are you holding anything back from him? Solomon and the people of Israel at this time didn't hold anything back from the Lord. And the presence of God showed up in this temple and overwhelmed the priests because they did not hold anything back from the Lord. They didn't have to build a temple like this. They could have built it out of brick. They could have built it out of lumber. They could have built a nice build. They didn't have to make it out of gold and silver, but they did. They were extravagant in their worship. Are you holding anything back from the Lord? I believe with all my heart that God, God wants to have 
a relationship, an intimate relationship where God shows up. God wants to do these things. And so many times we blame the devil. Oh, the devil is stopping the Lord. The devil can't stop the Lord. (laughs) As a matter of fact, Satan led a rebellion. God isn't even the one that kicked him out of heaven. Michael, the archangel, is the one that kicked him out of heaven. Satan can't touch God. All of Satan's schemes, God just, house of cards, falls right down. But you and I can hinder God's work in our own life. We, we can do it. When we hold back from the Lord. When we say, Lord, this part of my life is yours, but this part over here, this secret part, this is mine. And you, you don't have any access to this. I'm not giving this to you. Wait a minute. God wants all of you. And God wants to show up in a powerful way. God wants to move amongst his people. And he, he, he needs people. He needs some crazy people. That's what he needs. You know why he needs crazy people? He needs people who are going to say, you know what? I see Jesus walking on water. And the first thought that pops into their head is not, uh, it's a ghost. The first thought is, I want to go with you. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about Peter's first thought? Was not, oh my gosh! It was, I want to go! Peter is insane! He's a good insane. You ever ever thought about David? There's Goliath. Everybody else is running away. Common sense would say run away. And he says, no, I'm going to go after him with a rock. Dude's built like a tank, David. It's okay, I just need a rock. You ever thought about Paul? I was reading this story. It's amazing. They get mad at Paul. Paul is preaching the gospel. They stone Paul and kill him. You know Paul died in, the, in Acts? He dies. I don't know how else to describe that. They stone him and bury him with the rocks they were stoning him with. The church shows up, prays for him. Paul gets back up and says, come on, let's go back into the city and start preaching the gospel again. They just killed you. They didn't try to kill you. They actually kill you. No, we got to go tell people about Jesus, man. Come on. He needs people like that who aren't going to hold anything back from him. We want the Lord to show up like this. I want the Lord to show up like this. I am sick and tired of praying for people and some of the people getting healed and and some of them not. I want to see everybody healed. I'm shooting for a hundred percent. But we can't do that If we're holding things back from the Lord. If we're saying, oh Lord, we're praising you with this hand, but with this hand we're doing things we should not do. Oh yes, Lord, praise the Lord, the same mouth that's over there. Praise Jesus, praise Jesus. Did you hear about sister so-and-so? It's not gossip, it's a prayer request. (laughs) We want the Lord to move and we want the Lord to, to, to manifest his presence. And I want this place to be a place that it already is, but to be even more, that this is a place where we glorify the name of Jesus, where people can come and meet Jesus. But if we're giving God lip service or we're building with straw and wood instead of gold and silver, the gold and silver of our lives, what does that communicate to God? If, if I... When I proposed to my wife, I bought her a ring. Wasn't as big of a ring as I had wanted to because I, you know, couldn't. I was a youth pastor. But I bought a ring. I I went and I went shopping for it. I asked my mom and my sister for help because I never bought a girl's ring before. And I I found one and I I purchased it and I proposed to Sarah. What if I had been like, "Eh, yeah, here's a plastic ring. You want to, you know. Come on. Does that communicate love? <laughs> if I'd have been like, uh, hey, babe, I found this in a Cracker Jack box. Here you go. Let's, you know, let's get hitched. <laughs> no. I went. I bought a ring. I love her. <laughs> I, I, I bought a ring. I, I planned it out. I thought about it. I tried to figure it out. Right? I wasn't holding back from her. But if I did hold back from her, what would that have communicated? What would that have communicated in a natural marriage? What does that communicate to God when we hold back from him? And when we hold back from him by the things we say and by the things we do, maybe you don't, maybe you say, well, I'm not trying to hold back from God. Well, take inventory. 
Because you know what? I want the Lord to show up like this. I want to be so overwhelmed that the worshipers can't keep singing. And I can't come up and preach because God's presence is, is made manifest in our midst. Because it's only Jesus who can help your family. It's only Jesus who can heal the sick. It's only Jesus who can do those things. And if we aren't inviting Jesus to come, if Jesus doesn't have a nice place to come hang out in, we're messed up and we need help. I don't want to be part of a dead church ever again. I want God's presence. I don't want God's presence so I can say, ooh, look at us. So I can feel some, ooh. I want God's presence here because when God is here, things change. People change. Laws change. Revival breaks out. And on an aside, I think revival is coming. I've been saying this and I think revival is coming. And we'll get to this next verse about if my people pray. But I think that, and I read this from a, from a pastor. Every time that a demon is cast out, there's a manifestation. I think that there's about to be a manifestation in our country. I think that things are about to get a little crazy. Cray, cray. But I think that God is going to pour out his presence. And God is going to pour out his spirit on his church. If his church would press in. If his church would welcome him in. If his church would be singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who, who take palm branches and lay them down before him. Come Lord, come on in. That the king would come in. That's what I want. I want in my life and I want in our church. Is for Jesus' name to be glorified. And for his presence to be there. Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people who are called by my name... My people who are called by my name, who bear the name of God. I'm going to tell you something. The moment that you got saved, the moment that you asked Jesus into your heart, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit and you took his name. We're called Christian. Christ, Ian. Little Christ is literally how you translate that word. It's like a bunch of little Jesuses running around because we follow Jesus. They used it as a derogatory word originally, and we took it, and for 2,000 years, we literally bear the name of Christ. That's what they call us. If you, who are called by his name, would humble yourselves and pray. I got into a theological debate with somebody one time about this verse. Oh, that was just for them back and then, back at that time. And I believe, Pastor Jimmy said this the other day, and I'm going to steal his phraseology for that. There is one historical context for every word in scripture. It was written in a historical context at a historical time that had historical meaning to that person. But I believe that there are multiple applications for a text of scripture, or there can be multiple applications for a text of scripture. Not every scripture has multiple applications. Thou shalt not murder <laughs> doesn't have multiple interpretations for that. Okay? That's pretty cut and dry. Okay? But I believe that there can be applications there. And I believe that God is the same. And so if God is telling his people back then, if you humble yourselves and pray and seek my face, I'm going to show up. And all the things that I do are going to show up with me. I'm going to heal. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to do all of these things. And I believe that that's absolutely true for the time of Solomon. And I believe that's absolutely true for us. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Not just pray. Not just say words. I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. I don't believe in the power of prayer. People get freaked out when I say that. You know why I don't believe in the power of prayer? Because Muslims pray. They pray five times a day. They pray more than we do. Hindus pray. Jews pray. They pray at the Wailing Wall. They pray, right? Every religion prays. If it was just simply the act of praying, of saying words directed at heaven, 
right? Then every religion would have all kinds of answers for prayer, right? When you watch a football game, fans on both sides pray for their team to win. <laughs> right? So I don't believe that just doing the act of praying has power. I believe the object, the person you're praying to is what matters. That has power or doesn't have power. You can pray to a statue all day and it's never going to answer you. And we laugh at <laughs> those idolaters, they worship statues. <laughs> and we have the same gods. They don't have names like Zeus or Hera or Baal or Asherah or Moloch. But they have names like money and entertainment and sex and hypocrisy and gossip, right? They have all the same names. I mean, they don't have the same names, but they do all the same things. It's when we pray to the Lord who sits enthroned in heaven who is so other and yet loves us and sent his son to die for us. And when we pray in the name of Jesus, that's when prayer has power. Amen. And here the Lord is saying, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Sometimes we can pray arrogantly. Right? We can, we can do that. Lord, I'm praying to you because I'm supposed to as a Christian. So, Lord, please bless my family and help the pygmies in New Guinea. Sometimes we can pray with a bad heart, right? Lord, look at what they did and strike them down with lightning. Lord, get them. We can pray all kinds of ways. Every emotion you want, you can pray with. The Lord says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. Humble yourself before the Lord. Lord, you said that I can come to you, that I am your son, that I am your daughter, and that I can boldly approach the throne of grace. But Lord, I humble myself in your presence. You are God. Your will be done, not mine. Your will on earth as it is in heaven. And you humble yourself before the Lord. And, he says, seek my face. We're not just praying because we want to get things from the Lord. We want to seek his face. We want to get to know him. We want intimacy with him. He's not some faraway God who sits on a throne with a flowing white beard. and said, ah, you did something wrong. <coughs> Lightning bolt. He's father. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. He's our dad. Sometimes we translate Abba as daddy. It's not really daddy. It's more like dad. But Abba. He's our dad. He's our father. And he wants us to spend time with him. If you're a dad or you're a parent in this room, you understand that longing in the heart. You want your kids to have a relationship with you. You want, you want to help your kids. If your kids are going through a problem, if you've got adult kids, you want them to come and talk to you because you will help. That's how God feels. God wants you to seek his face. God wants you to pursue him. Come on. Come talk to me. Quit running. Quit messing around. Come and spend time with me. And get over yourself. Humble yourself and pray. We, we hold on to things sometimes and it hinders our prayers. We hold on to these things that really it's sin, it's ugly, and it's hurting us. It's this ugly little rat thing and it stinketh. It's King Jamesian. <laughs> it stinketh. And we come, we come to the altar, Lord, we put it down, Lord, take this. And it's this sin that we have. It's this thing, Lord, take it from me. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we go and we pick the thing back up again. Leave that dead thing there. 
Lay aside, Hebrews says, lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares you and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And in order to do that, you have to humble yourself because you have to take stock of yourself. You have to look at yourself honestly and say, Lord, I come naked before you. I, I'm, I'm all of my ideas of who I am or my, Lord, I lay all that stuff down. and I'm completely bare before you. I need you, Lord. I need your help. Come, Holy Spirit. Those are the kind of prayers that God always answers. That's the type of, the person who pursues God, who seeks his face. Those are the people that get answers to prayer. It's the lady with the issue of blood who said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment and went through the people and just touched him. It's the blind man who is crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they tell him, shut up. And he goes, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they say, shut up. And he cries louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then you know what they tell him? <gasps> Jesus is calling you. <laughs> it's those type of people. If my people who were called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Turn from them. Turn from them. Don't, don't wean yourself off of it. Don't slow down. Stop it. <laughs> turn from them. There's a joke that tell them about California stops. You ever heard of California stop? In California, in a, I grew up in a small town. And so it was even worse. You don't so much as stop <laughs> as you do as you just sort of slow down. And uh, if there's nobody there. You just, you go, right? You're not, you're, there's not a full, you know, stop. <laughs> and there was a man that uh, was driving and he came to a stop sign and he did a California stop. He just sort of rolled through the stop sign. And wouldn't you know it, there was a police officer right there and he didn't see him. And whoop, whoop. And so police officer gets out of the car and he's talking. He goes, you know, you didn't, uh, you didn't stop at the stop sign. He goes, well, yeah, I did. I said, no, you didn't. He goes, it's basically the same thing. Okay. And the officer says, okay, get out of the car. He gets out of the car. He takes his baton and he starts hitting him. And he says, now you want me to stop or you want me to slow down? <laughs> it was in California, Dwayne. It wasn't here. It wasn't any of the, <laughs> there's a difference. Turn from your evil ways. I'm very excited with what's happening in our country. I'm very excited about the turning from evil. Yeah. I'm very excited about this, about the possibility of what the Lord is going to do. My hope is not in the government or in the Supreme Court or in any legislative body. My hope is in Jesus. Yeah. And I'm excited about what Jesus is doing. Yeah. But if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Stop it. You already know that thing is bad and it's hindering your walk with the Lord. It's hurting you. Don't slow down. Don't put it away for a season and then bring it back. Stop it. Kill that thing. Get rid of it. I don't know what the thing is, but get it out. In our church, we cannot tolerate sin. Now, are there, do we mess up? Yes. There's grace and mercy for us. If we enter into, into the, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, right? But if we allow sin, if we tolerate sin in our church body, and if you tolerate sin in your house, in your life, it will destroy you. It will stop the work of God in your life. And it will ultimately destroy you because the wages of sin is death. That's, that's what you're dealing with, with sin. Oh, but it's just a little bit. Pastor, look, I'm just, it's just this little thing. Oh, it's only a little death. Oh, okay. It's death. Dead is dead. <laughs> There's not... Despite what the Princess Bride says, there's not mostly dead. It's, like, it's dead. 
Dead is dead. Sin, sin brings death. And it will hinder the work of God. And we want God to show up in this powerful way. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of justice. But we, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. We have a God who hears us. We have a God who sees us. God told Moses, I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their cries. Isaiah says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. God hears. God hears you. God is not far from you. God is not hiding from you. God hears and God sees. And at night when you're calling out to the Lord, or when you're by yourselves and you don't think anybody's hearing you, the Lord hears you, and the Lord sees you, and the Lord knows and the Lord has an answer. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord has an answer. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Amen. And we need to seek him. This is not about, I want to be careful because I don't want you to think that I'm saying, listen, listen, Here's the checklist of things for you to do. And once you've done the checklist, you will have earned God's favor. And God is now obliged to do something for you. I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about a relationship. I'm talking about intimacy with the Lord. And this is the way you have intimacy with the Lord. This is not, well, Lord, I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this. Now you owe me. That's not actually humbling yourself. So no, you didn't do the thing. We humble ourselves. We need to know that we're talking to our good Father who hears us. Who hears us. Who hears you and who sees you. I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. The forgiveness of sin is a huge deal. It is one of, if not the most important thing as part of the gospel message. When, when they cut a hole in the roof to lower the man down to Jesus, Jesus looks at the man. He very clearly cannot walk. If he's been that way for a long time and he's been out begging, <laughs> there are, it's very clear this man cannot walk. And he sees the faith of the friends and he looks at the man and he says, your sins are forgiven. Wait a minute, Jesus. We're asking you for healing. Yeah, but the important thing here is, is in here. This man needs to know that his sins are forgiven. This man needs to know that he's a new person in Christ. This man needs to know that his father loves him and that he's new. He needs to know, he needs to know the gospel. And he needs to know that his sins are forgiven. I believe very much that when Jesus says these things and we don't completely understand, I believe very much that the person that Jesus told that to has a huge impact in their lives. I'm willing to bet that that man <laughs> broke and started crying. That was his greatest need. And then the Pharisees, the religious leaders, <gasps> that religious spirit is still around in churches. You don't want that religious spirit. You want to get, if you, <laughs> you need to pray and ask the Lord to give you a clean heart, to be humble before the Lord, and to not have that religious spirit, because that religious spirit kills churches. And we don't want it in here. We don't want that self righteous, religious. You know, I was <laughs> thinking about the person I got into a debate with about this passage. And. Man, it was a debate. They were uh, gasped and religious. And now they're lamenting that they can't kill babies anymore. Mm, I think there's some compromise there. You're pretending to be very conservative about the Bible. 
uh, but really, you don't like that I'm saying humble yourself and pray. And there's a religious spirit that is there that's choking you. The Pharisees see this. <gasps> and then Jesus. <laughs> I love Jesus' answer. He goes, why do you say this in your hearts? Who is this who blasphemes, who, who can forgive sins but God alone? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Get up and walk. Instantly, that man was healed. <laughs> Talk about ticking off a religious spirit. He says, guys, this is what you're thinking. But hey, listen, that's not actually what I'm claiming. No, he goes, hey, you know what you're thinking about how only God can do this? Watch this. Get up. <laughs> I'm God. That's what Jesus... That's what Jesus did. But that man needed to be forgiven of his sins. And once that was dealt with... God, Jesus used him as a, as a case study about the power of God. That's what he did. He, he showed God's power in his life. He showed that God can forgive sins and that God can heal. This man's life, now and for all of eternity, is a testimony to God's ability to forgive sins and his ability to heal. That's what he did in that moment. I'm not saying that his sickness was caused by a sin. I'm not saying that, I, I don't know. The information that we're given, you can't say anything about that. But the information that we're given is that this man's life is a testimony to God's ability to heal. I mean, Jesus' ability to forgive sins and to heal. That's what this man's life is. That's what we want our lives to be. That the Lord would hear from heaven and forgive our sins. That there's an inward change. That there's an inward transformation. Deep in the core of who we are. It's a new birth. It's life and death. The old man has died. Behold, all things have become new. And then. And I will heal their land. When a spiritual transformation takes place in a person's heart, the rest of the world around them is affected. It's affected. The atmosphere changes. If you've had an encounter with God, and the God of the universe has made his home inside of you, there had better be some evidence of that in your life, and it should affect the things around you. Why? Because now you know that God is able and so when there's a sick person, hey, let me pray for you. Hey, when there's somebody, let me, let, me, let me tell you about my Jesus. Lord, my finances are not mine, they're yours. I give them to you. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in the blessings of the Lord. I'm going to walk as a, as a follower of Jesus. I've given my life to, he gave his life for me, and I'm giving my life to him. And the very ground that we walk on should be affected. Because the Lord will heal it. Did you know a land can be sick? If it can be healed, the inverse is probably true. It can be sick. Same is true for a family. Same is true for a city, a town, a community. That's what sin does. It affects and it spreads out. But when there's salvation, when there's a forgiveness of sin... Holiness spreads out too. Glory infects things. And I want my family infected by glory. I want my town infected by glory. I want my city and my state and my country to be infected by Jesus. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray... And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal, heal their land. Oh, that we would do this. Oh, that we would pursue the Lord and not hold anything back from him. That we would pursue him with all that we have. And, and that our lives would be dedicated to him with gold and silver and precious stones, the precious things in your life. And that the Lord would show up in a powerful way, just like he did 
in the time of Solomon, the king of Israel, that the presence of the Lord could be felt. And I'm telling you, the reason that Sarah and I wanted to come was because as soon as we drove onto the church property, we felt the presence of the Lord. Amen. God is at work. God is calling us as a church into this, that we would lift the name of Jesus on high and that his presence would be here, be here and that there would be salvations and healings and a revival. Let's wrap all that up in one word and call it revival. But that we would humble ourselves and pray and seek his face, that the Lord would break out in this place. That he would break out in our homes and in our families and in our, in our health, in our finances, in our emotions, in our inward thoughts, all of it. That we would be overwhelmed by the goodness of God. That this place, that this place would be filled with the presence. That you would be filled with the presence. Because you're the temple. It's not a building. This is a beautiful building, but it's not the temple. If they were to come and destroy this church, like they do in other countries, they burn the churches down and they destroy them, or the government comes in, like in China, and demolishes the church. If they did that, they would not destroy the temple of God. Because it's us. You're a living stone. May God fill his temple. Don, I'm going to ask you to come up and play. Let's pray. As Don plays, let's pray and ask the Lord to fill this place. Only today, I'm going to ask you to pray, not me. So lift your voices in the name of Jesus and pray. Lift your voices and pray to him and ask him to fill this place. Don't wait for me. Pray. You know what's going on in your house. You know what's going on in your home. You pray. Lift your voices to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We lift your name on high, Lord Jesus. Fill us. Come, Holy Spirit.
worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power and praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Blessed is the Lamb who was slain. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who carried our sins and our sorrows and our griefs, and by his stripes we are healed. Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed in this place. Holy Spirit, come. There's somebody sitting here this morning who needs a touch from you, Lord. They're struggling with things, Lord. And their mind is not at ease, Lord. Our Holy Spirit, I pray, and you, I pray that you come and touch them right now in Jesus' name. There's someone here who's sick, who Satan is attacking their body. And in the name of Jesus, we rebuke the enemy. And we say, be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, there are lots of families who are struggling right now, who are struggling with sickness. Lord, look at what Satan is doing. And rebuke the enemy, Lord. And send healing in Jesus' name. Lord, there are marriages that are in trouble, Lord, and they need you. Lord, you can bring the dead things back to life. Lord, you can bring love where there is hate. So Holy Spirit, fill, this, fill the marriages in our church, Lord, that your presence would be there. Lord, there are those who are wrestling with doubt, doubt about trusting you. Lord, reveal yourself to them, Lord, that the doubts would vanish away and that they would know that you are able and that you are trustworthy. And Lord, there are those who are within the sound of my voice who don't know you. Lord, today we say today is the day of salvation. Save the souls, Lord that their sins can be forgiven, that they would know the joy of the Lord and that their sins would be forgiven, Lord. Lord, there are prodigals who have run away from you, who have gone off and chased after things that they ought not to have chased after, Lord, and now they're feeding pigs. Bring them home, Lord. Let them know that you're the good father who runs and embraces who takes off the filthy rags and gives brand new robes of righteousness and joy. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed in this place. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Play some. Let's stand as we sing this together. I surrender all. Lift your hands, lift your voices. I surrender all.
Blessed be your name, O Lord, for you alone are worthy. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we surrender all, Lord, because we want to humble ourselves and pray. We want to seek your face, Lord, and turn from our wicked ways, Lord, that you would hear from heaven, Lord, that you would forgive us and that you would heal our land, Lord. Lord, send revival. Start with us, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Lord. And we're in awe of what you do, Lord. Fill us with your presence, Lord. So in the name of Jesus, I pray. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you, Lord. Don't hold back from the Lord. His presence is here. Receive him. Open your hearts to the Lord to receive what he has for you for today. Lift your hands or come to the altar or right where you are, but call out to the Lord right now. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Come, Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord. Blessed be your holy name. Come, Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah to your name, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And Lord, we ask for more. We ask that you fill us and overwhelm us with you. Go with us today, Lord. And be with us. Lord, that we can carry your presence and that even the land around us would be healed. That when we find ourselves in a situation, Lord, that it would be you who speaks and not us. That when people encounter us, because we are your temple and we have your presence, that they would encounter Jesus. Because the world, because our country needs Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed in this place and in our lives and in our homes. Be with us, Lord, and go with us. 
that we leave this building, but never from your presence. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord be with you this week and bring us back safely for this next service. God bless.